Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. I am coming to you uh, from sunny Southern California. However, I am pre-recording today's show. I have been here all weekend attending the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree, which is always a mouthful and always delightful. We had a wonderful weekend, but I will be on the road traveling home by the time our regularly scheduled program usually airs. So I'm pre-recording today's program, and that just means that I will not be available on our live chat immediately following the broadcast. Please feel free to get on chat anyway. We have a lot of really wonderfully helpful people in the community who can answer your questions. And then I will be back live with you on Thursday. Let's talk about today's topic. We are covering our family history wiki today. Now, if you're not aware, Ancestry.com has a wiki. Uh, A wiki is just simply a way in which we can put information online in an editable format, which means as that information changes or as new information becomes available, it's really quickly and easily editable by anyone in the community, including yourself. So you can add information that you might know about record types, about collections that exist um, in archives or libraries where you might live, but The foundation of the Family History Wiki on Ancestry.com is actually an amazing resource tool. It's an amazing research tool available to you to be able to discover what records exist, where those records are held, to help you learn a little bit more. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and dive in. I just have a few things prepared, and then we're going to actually look at the wiki. So here's where you're going to find this. And wiki is seen, wiki's kind of a funny word, and the fact that I keep saying it over and over again, it just makes it kind of even more silly. But <laughs> you're going to find the Family History Wiki by hovering over the Learning Center on Ancestry.com, and then you're going to scroll down to the bottom and click on Family History Wiki. Here's what that looks like. If I'm on Ancestry.com anywhere, you've got this Learning Center uh, button up here. Just move your mouse over it, and then scroll down to the bottom. You're going to see Family History Wiki. And when I click on that, it's going to take me to a page that looks like this. Now, one of the things about wikis is that they come in a standard format, which means we don't have a lot of ability to make it look pretty. (laughs) It's just a repository of information. And so we've done our best to to do what we can, but this is the format that it's going to be in. So make yourself familiar with it. Maybe just spend a little bit of time looking at it and figuring out how that works. I'll show you a few things so that you'll feel a little more comfortable doing that. Um, One of the first things you're going to want to do is just explore to discover what's available. There's this kind of um, basic principle that I think sometimes we forget, which is you don't know what you don't know. And so we oftentimes uh, learn or approach research based on the information we do know. But because there are things we don't know, it never occurs to us to look for our family in that record or to research in this way. And so one of the really cool things about the Family History Wiki is that it gives you an opportunity to explore and learn new things along the way. There are a few tools we've provided for you to do that. (coughs) Excuse me. You can just click here in this Explore the Wiki section where you can, can go straight to the book, The Source, or straight to the Red Book. Those are the two books that we used to create the foundation of this Um, database. Or every day there is what's called a featured article. You can just click on that and read this featured article and that rotates. It's kind of a random rotating article that just shows up. So in this case today the article is selected proceedings and courts. And so I could click on that and it would take me to a page that would tell me about um, court records and judicial proceedings and (laughs) court orders and petitions and anything that my my ancestor may have been involved in um, adoption records or guardianship papers. Um, I know that in the South there are bastardy records, any of those that might have been records that were created, particularly as you start to get back into the late 1700s and early 1800s, when census records become more sparse and then eventually non-existent, um, you need to start looking at other kinds of records. 
this is just one of those, this feature article is just one of those places where you're going to see things once in a while and think, huh, I don't know anything about that. Maybe I'll go read an article today. That's how I hope that you will kind of explore or um, just investigate what's available so that you might be able to learn something new. Now, of course, there are some specific ways to search the Family History Wiki, and I will cover those as well. Um, you can search. I usually do it by state and then the word vital, and then I can search specifically for, you know, Oklahoma vital records or, or California vital records or New Jersey vital records, and it will give me a, an article that tells me when the state started keeping vital records, who holds those records still, and we'll look at that. So let's come over here <clears throat> to the wiki, and let me just show you a few different things so that you can be a little bit more comfortable working it on your own. Let's start with the source. So the source was published back in 1984, the very first time. I still remember when I bought my first copy of the source. I think it was about $75 and it weighed almost 50 pounds, I'm convinced. Um, I think it actually weighed like 23 pounds in reality. But um, it, it's just this amazing guidebook to American genealogy. And it was the, the one of the original editors was Lou Zooks, who was actually a vice president here at Ancestry.com. She's an incredible, incredible genealogist and human being. And she has, with her fellow editors, um, put together <clears throat> this amazing resource of record types. So basically the way that the book is organized, and you can see here from the table of contents, it's organized by types of records. So I could come here and click on census or directories or military. There's also some eth ethnic research guides, things like African American and Hispanic and Jewish and Native American. There's information here about doing re uh, research in colonial in colonial America, so colonial English records, colonial Spanish records, you know, who holds the records that were created before the United States became the United States, <clears throat> before Texas and California became part of the United States and were previously um, owned by Spain at one point. And so, I mean, you just start to look at where those records are for the Americas, um, particularly North America, before it became the countries that we know it as today. Many of us have roots in this country that go back that far, and so we need to have that information. So I can click then. What we've done is we've taken this table of contents from this book, and we've made every chapter or section of this book a link. So you can click on any one of those things to learn more about that topic. So for example, if I click on census, it takes me to this page that is an overview of the U.S. Census. Now, it's a pretty long article, but this article gives you really great information. And on almost all of these, you're going to find, again, a little table of contents with clickable links. So I can come in here and I can say, well, really what I'm interested in is problems with accuracy in the census or problems created at the time the census was taken, or here's a good one, instructions for enumeration. What were the enumerators told, the census enumerators, what were their instructions when they went around? So for example, there was a period of time where the instruction to the census taker was they had to return to each home um, a minimum of three times if they could never find anybody home. But after that third time, they could ask anyone that was willing to give them information about the family that lived in that house. And so understanding that helps you understand why sometimes information on censuses is so inconsistent. Maybe your family never even talked to a census taker. Maybe it was the guy that lived next door that had just moved in the month earlier and didn't even know really who those children were that ran around his yard all day. So you have to kind of understand about how and why and when and where and the conditions under which those records were created so that you can understand what it is that you're looking at. It, it kind of changes the way you look at a census record. And so this article provides you with some really helpful information and you can jump to the different sections using this table of contents with the links. Now over here on the right hand side, we're reading an overview of the U.S. Census, but I can also drill down to specific years of the census. So you'll see we have listed here all of the years of the U.S. federal censuses. 
I could go and read about information specific to that census. There's also information here about using sound X and non-population schedules. For those of you who aren't aware, there are other pieces to the census than what we call the population schedule, which is what we typically know of as the census. There are agricultural censuses that tell how many um, different kinds of livestock your ancestor may have had. Um, there are slave censuses in 1850 and 60. There are Native American censuses. There are, you know, there's all these different pieces and parts to the census. And what we typically know of as, as the census is just the population schedule. And so you can learn about some of those other parts and where they exist. And some of them do exist on Ancestry.com. There's also information here about state censuses. Many states also take a census and they do it every 10 years on the fives. So here in the United States, we take the federal census every 10 years on the, te on the zeros and the state census that are often taken every 10 years on the fives. And so you could learn about which states participated in that, which states took those censuses, which states censuses survive, which ones are online. Again, all of that's going to be in an article here on the wiki. And so I would encourage you to just, again, explore some of these topics or ideas. And then when you get to one of those articles, so for example, here's the article for the 1830 census, then I can scroll down and learn more about which what the specific questions were that were asked, some important facts, some research tips, and then here's my favorite thing on the census wiki. We have created here a table, or there has been created a table that compares every census from 1790 to 1940. It lists here every field that was uh, indexed or uh, enumerated, and then there's a little checkbox in the table here to tell you what years that information occurred. That's important, and, it, and it's something that I would hope all of you would spend at least a few minutes with or bookmark as a reference because I get asked questions every single day about information like this. Well, what does that column mean, and where does that information start? You know, when did people start recording the name of everybody in the household in the census? Well, that was in 1850. Prior to that, it only recorded the name of the head of household. Um, when did you start recording, when did the census start recording relationships of the people in the family to the head of household? Well, that didn't start until 1880. Again, this quick view chart helps you to understand that kind of information. And so I have a printed out version of this on my desk that I've that I refer to often, but I've also bookmarked this. So if I'm not sitting at my desk and I need to refer to it, here it is. You're going to find copies of that on several of the census, specific census pages. Now, let's talk about military records for just a minute. Another one of the categories in the source is military records. Um, I would guess that I get asked probably 10 or 12 times a week um, by people who are new to family history about why they can't find their own or their grandfather's World War I or World War II service records. Um, you may or may not be aware, but there was a fire in 1973 in St. Louis at the Military Personnel Records Department, and it destroyed about 80% of the military service records for men who had served in the U.S. Army um, during World War I and World War II. And so a lot of those records no longer exist. However, there are still other kinds of records. Um, there are veterans benefits, there are pension files, there are, um, there are uh, admission documents, there are draft cards. There are so many different kinds of military records other than just a record of service. And so if you come in here to this overview of military records, you're going to see, start to see some of those things that you might not have considered before because you don't know what you don't know. And so I come in here and I look um, at the different kinds of uh, the different wars that occurred or the different conflicts that may have been going on when my ancestor lived in a certain place. And they're done in a kind of a timeline format here so I can go through the colonial wars and then the post-revolutionary wars and then what we call modern wars 
just to see what conflicts were going on for people who lived here in the United States so that I know what um, service they may have rendered. A lot of us have fathers and grandfathers who served in World War II or World War I, but you start getting back into um, the Spanish-American War, the Civil War, the Indian Wars, the War of 1812, back up to the Revolutionary War, and then of course there were the French and Indian War before that, and, and so you just get this idea or this feeling for um, the specific time period during which those conflicts occurred. That becomes important not just because of military service, but also because a lot of those men who served were granted land grants, meaning they received property in return or in exchange for their service. And those land grants are important because they help you understand why your family may have ended up in a certain place. You know, maybe they fought um, in the revolution for, you know, the state of New York, but then they ended up down in New Jersey or they ended up over in Ohio. Um, all of that can be traced back in some cases to um, these land grants received for military service. So this helps you understand what conflicts occurred during what times, and you see this kind of timeline um, broken out with all these different um, wars, and then you can read more about each of those conflicts to understand the kinds of records that were kept around those conflicts. Sometimes they're specific to your soldier. Um, sometimes they are just about the battles themselves. Sometimes they're about troop movements. A lot of times what we're going to find are things called muster rolls, which are basically just an accounting every month of who was available for service and who was still sick and who had gone home to visit his family and who was out on a scouting mission. And, you, you know, you'll read through these lists of names that's basically just a roll call, but that helps you follow your ancestor through their service and kind of almost recreate that service record. So muster rolls are a really terrific resource. So all of that is just um, going to help you kind of understand more about the kinds of records available and then start to get a feel for where those records exist. Now, the second major resource in the Ancestry.com wiki is what's called the Red Book. The Red Book is um, kind of the standard go-to resource for American genealogy. If you need to know anything about a state or a county or a town in the United States, and what records were created by that entity, then you can, you, then the Red Book is the place you want to go. <coughs> Excuse me. It is organized. Um, there is some information about um, by record type, but mostly it is organized by location. So if I scroll down to the table of contents here, you're going to see it's just an alphabetical listing of the states in the United States. So I could come here and I can click on any one of these states and it will take me to a state research page. These are, every one of these is an article written by a genealogist or in this case two, who are experts in research in that location. Oftentimes you're gonna find maps um, that you can click on and expand. Um, in this case, it's a map of all of the counties in the state of Illinois. And you, it's a really quick resource again for you to be able to just visualize, well, if my ancestors were living in this county, could this really be them I found way over here in this other county in that census? Or maybe should I be looking back over here by where they were born and married and, and lived their whole lives? So, it, so maps are a wonderful resource and there, a lot of them are available here on these pages. It also gives you a history of the place. In this case, um, there is information about when the first settlers came. That kind of information is good for what we call a gut check. If you've got uh, events occurring in a location before people were living there, maybe you've written a century down wrong or transcribed some inaccurate information. So having kind of an understanding of when the place was settled, not just when the place was settled, but a lot of times you'll find information about when major migration waves of people came in and where those people came from. A lot of times you're going to see large groups of Germans coming into an area or large groups of Irish coming into an area. And understanding those migration patterns might help you understand better when or why your family came into that location. And so those overview articles, that's the information that they provide. In this case, there's also information about, specifically about the counties 
in Illinois with addresses for contacting the county and a chart here about when the county started or when the state started keeping birth, marriage and death records at the county level for those locations. And so I could come here and say, you know, Adams County, Illinois was formed in 1825. They started keeping marriage records in 1825, but they didn't start keeping birth records until 1877. However, their land records go back to 1817 and their probate records start in 1826. So that's how I would read a chart like this where I can just say, here's this county in Illinois. Here's where I'm going to be able to write to this address to get information that I might not be able to find online. And here's the information that exists at that county. So um, take advantage of those state pages kind of as an overview for that family history research. Now down the, the last thing I'm just gonna show you here, down the right hand side of the page on every one of these state pages, you're then going to see a breakdown by record type. So once I get to a location, I might wanna know, okay, well what specific vital records exist for the state of Illinois? And that will take me to an additional article that explains exactly when the state started keeping vital records. You'll see some links here. In this case, there's a link to the Illinois State Archive. There's a link to the Illinois Regional Archives Depository. Um, there's information here about how it was not mandatory that birth, marriage, and death records be kept until 1916. And so different counties may have different kinds of records. There's information about divorce records and marriage records. And then I just want to point this out um, as a special shout out. We have a user, because remember when I started, I explained that wikis are editable, which is kind of a funny, awkward word to say, but there you can edit them, you can update them, you can add information to them. We've given you this foundation based on these two books, the source and the red book, but you can come in and add information that helps make it even more useful. So we have a single user who has gone through every single one of our state vital records pages. And at the bottom of the page, she has added, I assume it's a she based on her username, she has added links to where on Ancestry.com you can find the vital records for that state. So in this case, not just the state level records, but she's also listed some of the county level records as well. So it's just an additional way to get to the records that you're trying to find, which really is ultimately why you would use the wiki. You are trying to learn more about your family. You don't know what you don't know. And so we have provided in the Learning Center this family history wiki to help you explore, to discover what's available, to maybe learn something new that might give you an aha moment and revitalize your research. Or you can also use this Family History Wiki to search specifically by a record type or by a location to see what's available so that you can continue to grow your family tree, to learn more about your ancestors, and to tell their stories. That is all I have prepared for you today. Just a reminder that this presentation is pre-recorded, so I will not be available on chat following the presentation, but feel free to chat amongst yourselves. We have a lot of experienced people in the community who would be happy to help you. And if you have any questions, I'll have this archived on YouTube sometime in the next day or two, and you can leave comments there. I will monitor those and respond as necessary. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.